Okay, nevertheless. Um, so what I want to do today is to give you a little bit of an insight into my work, but also generally what the, the Clavers lab, uh, lab is doing. And uh, we in the Clavers lab, we are mostly interested in adult tissue stem cells. So those cells in, in the you know, different tissues that we generate them, but also the cells that actually um, cause cancer when regeneration turns malignant. So on the one hand, we are very much interested in how are these cells regulated? How do these cells turn into different cell types? But on the other hand, um, of course, we are interested in developing systems that allow us to culture these stem cells in vitro, to do different assays with them, to do manipulations with them. Now, historically, our, our work on, on adult tissue stem cells started in our favorite tissue, the intestine. The, the intestine is indeed an extremely fascinating um, machine, I would say, because it, it turns over extremely quickly. Uh, where's the, ah yeah, yeah. So um, within three to five days, the, the complete epithelium lining, epithelial lining of the intestine is replaced. And this replacement is fueled by stem cells that sit down here in this so-called crypt structure, hence my question before, and they proliferate continuously and their offspring moves up this crypt villus axis. While these cells move upwards, they actually differentiate. So they differentiate to the many different cell types um, of the intestine until they finally die um, at the tip of the villus. Um, in 2007, um, a postdoc in the Clavers lab identified an amazing marker for these stem cells that sit down here in this crypt. So this marker is LGR5, and as you can see, it labels kind of every second cell here at the bottom of the crypt. And this is because these stem cells sit between so-called panet cells, which provide the, the niche for these cells. They provide signaling molecules that allow the stem cell to retain its stemness and to um, proliferate. Two years later, um, another postdoc in the Clavers lab um, wanted to, to find a method to actually isolate these cells, to culture them, and um, essentially study them in, in vitro, because so far there was no way to do that. So adult tissue stem cells have been, in contrast to ES cells, for example, very inaccessible for a long time. And in the end, what we, we ended up finding out after um, a lot of different tries is that when he isolates these LGFI positive stem cells and he puts them in a 3D environment, so in a gel, in this case in Marty gel, together with a defined medium, these um, stem cells would not only proliferate, but they would actually form a structure that very much uh, resembles the tissue it came from. Because when you look at this organoid here, for example, we have here these appendages here, these crypt structures, and similar to the, the primary tissue where we have the stem cells sitting down here, also in these crypts, we find the stem cells um, next to panet cells, whereas the, the body of the organoid, if you want, would essentially resemble the villus where more differentiated cells are located. So at first, of course, that was um, just a mouse. Shortly after, we managed to do the same also for human cells. Um, but we also asked ourselves, can we do this for more tissue? And one very encouraging fact is that LGR5, this marker for adult tissue stem cells, is not only found in the intestine. It is actually found in many, many different epithelial tissues. So um, here we have the small intestine. We also find it in stem cells of the colon, stem cells of the stomach, um, even in the hair follicle. And then we find it in tissues where we actually would not really expect it because tissues that have a relatively low turnover, like for example, the liver or the pancreas. In these tissues, we find it um, when we actually induce damage. So uh, both here in the pancreas and the liver, if you damage the tissue, you induce regeneration, we actually see that we have cell populations coming up that are act uh, actively regenerating the tissue and also these are positive for um, LGR5. 
Now, to make a relatively long shor story uh, short, um, we developed many different organoid systems so far. I have to admit, I did not even update this slide yet because there are way more. We have lung, liver, colon, breast, stomach, pancreas, small intestine, prostate. Now we have fallopian tube, um, uh, oral surface epithelium, um, what else? Ovarian surface epithelium. Well, at this point, almost any epithelium we can culture in one way or the other. All of these grow in 3D in um, multigel usually. They all have a defined media, but these defined media are very different depending on which um, organ you want to culture. And you can also see that structurally, these organoids are very different. Now, what I want to do today is not go from one organ to the next and tell you what, what kind of conditions we need to grow these organoids. What I want to focus on is actually what can you use these organoids for? And on the one hand, I want to give you um, one example how we can use these organoids to answer a basic research question, but I also want to show you how we can use them for disease modeling, for cancer research, and so forth. So let's start with basic research. Um, the example that I want to show you is something that um, uh, we, we published recently that it was one of uh, the things I um, worked on in the, in the last well, two, three years. And I think it's a beautiful example that shows how organoids can be used as a tool in combination with other technologies and um, in combination with mouse genetics, in combination with single cell sequencing to actually uh, solve fairly complex research questions. So I told you that the intestinal stem cell, so that, that would, would be this one, is the uh, one of the first ones we were able to culture in vitro. So as a result, we have a fairly good understanding of what kind of conditions, what kind of factors we need to guide the differentiation of these cells. So we know how do we turn the stem cell to an enterocyte, to an M cell, to a TUF cell, and so forth. However, there is one group of cells here that is still very elusive, and these are um, so-called enteroendocrine cells. So there are two reasons for that. One, these cells are very rare. So less than 1% of the intestinal epithelium is uh, comprised of these enteroendocrine cells. And the second reason is they are highly diverse. These are hormone producing cells and there are many different subtypes because there are many different <coughs> hormones that these can produce. Due to this um, diversity, they are also involved in many um, different mechanisms or, or regulations. They, they can sense nutrients, they control intestinal motility, um, they are directly linked to insulin secretion, appetite regulation, metabolic adaptation, and they also directly talk with the immune system. Now classically, these cells were characterized by the hormone that they produce. So a clip one producing cell is an L cell, <coughs> and CCK producing cell is an, is an I cell, and so forth. However, recently, there have been more and more studies that kind of describe more and more different enteroendocrine populations because they found cells that actually contain several hormones. So what, what I set out to do is not only to find out how many lineages are there really, but also to um, identify the exact um, transcriptional events that happen in the fate decision of every single lineage of the enteroendocrine um, system. Now, to do this, I created um, a new system. Oops, does it work? Yeah. So what I did is I created a reporter based, of, based on the expression of neurogenin-3. Neurogenin-3 is a gene that is expressed in the common enteroendocrine progenitor, and it is expressed as a pulse. So what I did is I linked two different fluorescence proteins to um, this gene. One here in green, very fast folding, but highly destabilized. The other one, slow folding, but it can be um, followed for a long time. So what I can do with this is now I can, by measuring the fluorescence of an individual cell, determine how much time has passed since it expressed neurogenin 3. Then I can sort these cells out, and perform 
single cell sequencing and actually combine the transcriptomic with the time information from the fluorescence to um, rebuild the complete tree of enteroendocrine differentiation. So in reality, that looks like this. So this would be just um, the intestine of uh, this neurogenes free chronomouse. And you can see we have here enteroendocrine cells in all these different stages of differentiation here, starting green, strong green, green and red, and finally just red. Um, what we don't have really is a good correlation between the fluorescence and actual time. Because we have no idea um, how much time has passed since the cell went from this stage to this stage, for example. So how can we do that? Well, one very complicated and expensive and difficult way would be to try to do this in animals. Um, to do some kind of in vivo imaging for more than a week, well, it's almost impossible. But luckily, we have an alternative for that. And that alternative is organoids. So this would be an intestinal organoid um, <coughs> that has this um, chrono reporter system integrated. And like in the primary tissue, we can see that we see enteroendocrine cells of all the different differentiation stages. Here, very early on, green, going to then the very late ones, like for example here that are just red. Now what we can do now is we can put this organoid um, under a microscope for weeks if we want and follow the differentiation of individual cells. So that would look like this, so that, that would be an individual cell. First it expresses the green fluorescence, then you can see the red fluorescence is coming up and we do that for many, many cells until we have a reliable correlation between the fluorescence intensity that we see and the time that has passed since the expression of neurogenesis free. So with this information, we can then look at an individual cell and say, according to the fluorescence, this cell is 35 hours after expression of neurogenesis free. And this we can now implement here. That would be um, from primary tissue. So uh, this n this the time information comes from organoids. Then we sort primary tissue cells here. We sort them into multivalent frames. And what we're doing is a so-called index sort. That means that for every cell, we know exactly the, the fluorescence. We know that the cell in well B12 is according to its fluorescence um, 12 hours after expression of neurogenesis. Then we process, process these plates with the cell B2 protocol, perform single cell sequencing, and then um, we get a data set that looks like this. So you can, here's an EMAP. It shows all the different um, enteroendocrine cell types that you would expect, K cells, I cells, X cells, and so forth, and also a big cluster of progenitors. Now we can now um, actually project the time information that we have from the fluorescence on this map and you can beautifully um, see that this correlates very well. We have here, even within the progenitor cluster here, the earliest cells and they get older essentially in this direction. And we can also see um, variability in, in the age of different enteroendocrine cell types. So these are on average much younger these ones are, for example. Now, we combined this um, time information and the transcriptomic information to actually rebuild these differentiation lineages of all the different enteroendocrine cell types. And this is where we actually um, had a big surprise because as it turned out, many of the cell types that according to literature that exists for 30 years probably were always expected to be individual lineages, like for example, L cells, are actually only transitory stages. Because for example, here from the uh, progenitor, a cell develops into an L cell, shortly after the cell develops into an I cell and finally into an N cell. So these enteroendocrine cells are actually able to switch the hormone that they produce in the course of their lifetime. Other lineage like delta cells, for example, do not do that, so a delta cell is born as a delta cell and will also die as a delta cell. Now, since we have a complete transcriptome for every single cell you see here, we can then also specific look at this branching point. So where the decisions are taken, do I turn into cell A or do I turn into cell B? 
And um, uh, we have done that. That uh, would look like this. This is focused here just on transcription factors. And then, um, of course, we have to find a way to actually prove that what we are finding here is relevant. Now, you would like to do that on as many genes as you can, right? Because you can, of course, pick one, but what does that really tell you? So what we wanted to do is to test um, at least nine. Again, this is not really feasible in a mouse. So again, we turn to organoids to do that. At that point, um, the, the reviewers here said, well, that's a very nice idea. But before you show me a phenotype in organoids, actually show me that um, the differentiation process in the organoids is exactly the same as it happens in the primary tissue. And I have to say, that is a valid point. So we essentially did that. Um, we performed the same experiment from primary tissue and from organoids. Um, so here you can see these different cell types. Here you can see the source of the organoid, either uh, the source of the cell, either from tissue or from organoid. And you can see that all of the clusters that we find here have contributions both from tissue and organoid, which means that the uh, enteroendocrine cells derived from tissue and organoid are transcriptionally almost indistinguishable. And even when we looked at the time frame that, it's that, uh, that enteroendocrine cells needed to differentiate, they were the same in the organoid and in the primary tissue. So in the end, we used this um, to knock out nine candidates that we identified. So essentially, we used organoids from a Rosa Cas9 mouse, in vitro transcribed gRNAs, um, selected clones that had the desired knockouts, and then tested enteroendocrine differentiation. This is just one example here where we knocked out POX3, which causes an increase in X cells, but instead um, a loss in enterochromatin cells. So in total, six of these nine candidates that we chose gave us beautiful enteroendocrine phenotypes, which I think is, um, well, a very, very uh, good argument for the quality of our data. All right. Um, we are, of course, continuing this work now in different tissues. You can look at different uh, differentiation pathways with the same system. We are also looking at the pancreas, for example. But now I would like to switch to um, a different topic, and that is using organoids as tools for disease modeling and regenerative medicine. And that goes into the second focus of my work in the Claver's lab, and that is the liver. So um, the liver, when you compare it to the intestine, is a very, very different organ. Um, the intestine, highly proliferative, turns over continuously. If you look at a section from a liver, you will hardly see any proliferating cells. Nevertheless, we know that if you cut away two thirds of the liver within 10 days approximately, the liver in a mouse will have regenerated. So there is huge capacity of regeneration in this tissue, even if it doesn't have a high base turnover. So the reason for that is that in the liver, um, different cells have the ability to divide. So the two main epithelial cell types in the liver are cholangiocytes and hepatocytes. They both developmentally come from the from the same origin, and both of them have the limited ability to regenerate. So normally, for normal turnover, a cholangiocyte will divide to produce more cholangiocytes, and a hepatocyte will divide to <coughs> produce more hepatocytes. However, when you have um, high levels of damage, or when the regenerative capacity of one of these lineages is depleted, we can also have an alternative regenerative response. And this is um, by de-differentiation, either of these cell types can form a bipotential progenitor that after the damage subsides can actually re-differentiate into either of these lineages. The whole story is a little bit more complicated because these cells remain biased to one lineage or the other, but for the purpose here, this is now not um, that critical. So what I've been doing together with um, two other very talented postdocs is to develop two human liver organoid systems. The first one that I developed together with Mary um, was based on this side of the tree, so on uh, cholangiocytes. And uh, we have shown that we can isolate the cells, we can de-differentiate the cells, 
and we can actually turn, oops, bah, 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 turn them also in battle sites in culture. The second system, uh, more recently, um, was uh, spearheaded by Hui Li, and here we started actually from, from battle sites. And you can see structurally, in the very beginning, these organoids are um, very, very different. So without going into too many details, um, I just want to give you an idea of what we can use this for. So for the cholangiocyte system, we um, focused on uh, disease modeling. So we have two examples here on the left side. This is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Uh, you have here a healthy donor and an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency patient. So this is usually a mutation in the serpin A1 gene. This mutation causes the protein to aggregate. It is produced in hepatocytes. So indeed, in the tissue, you see these large aggregates. And since um, alpha-1 antitrypsin is a neutrophil elastase inhibitor, um, since it cannot be secreted, these patients suffer from a wide array of different issues that is essentially um, caused by um, an overactivity of elastase that is digesting their own tissues. So if you now isolate organoids from either of those, we can see that we don't see any aggregates here in the organoid of the healthy donor, but we can find the same aggregates in um, the differentiated organoids of the patient. So this is now differentiation to the hepatocyte phase since hepatocytes are the main producer of these proteins. Now on the right side here, we have allergil syndrome. So this is now not an, an hepatocyte disease. This is actually a disease of the bilayer epithelium. And it is usually caused by mutation in either JAK1 or NOTCH2. And what happens there is that these patients suffer from bilayer paucity. So their bile ducts cannot form properly. They don't connect properly. And this is what we try to model here in the organoid. Again, up here we have the healthy donor. You can see the bilayer cells marked by keratin-19 are nicely integrated into the epithelium. Whereas in the patient, the same cells can actually be found rounded up in the lumen of the organoid. They're positive for cis peptid 3 so undergoing apoptosis, which is very similar to what is seen in these patients. So I also mentioned regenerative medicine before. And of course, we try to transplant these organoids into an acute damage model in mice. And we actually got some engraftment there. It was usually small, a few cells here, a few cells there. But all in all, it wasn't that convincing, which was actually one of the main reasons why we wanted to try to establish an alternative liver organoid system from hepatocytes. Because according to literature, hepatocytes are the best cell type you can possibly have to repopulate um, a damaged liver. And in fact, um, we did that. So these are now uh, the hepatocyte organoids. This is after three months in an uh, immunosuppressed tyrosinemia model mouse. So this is a chronic liver damage model. And you can see here in red as the human cells stained for human albumin in the mouse tissue. And you can see um, that even at this three, uh, three month time point, we have lots of cells that are positive for KA67. So they are still proliferating. And I hope you can appreciate how well the human cells are, are here actually integrated into um, the mouse liver, connected to the biliary system, connected to blood vessels, and so forth. Now, as was actually mentioned in the previous talk, we are now also trying to extend um, the liver organoid system uh, in vitro, in co-culture assays, uh, with vasculature, but also by combining actually bilayer organoids and hepatocyte organoids to try to form um, um, a more relevant liver structure in vitro. I don't have slides on that today, but I hope um, we will soon. Now, that brings me to the next um, big application of organoids, and that is, of course, organoids as cancer models. And in fact, I think organoids can serve as cancer models in a <coughs> wide variety of ways. And I want to show you some of the examples based on the work that we have done in the Clevers lab to, to showcase that. So the question is, what, what tissue do we actually start with? Well, one thing we can do, for example, is actually to start 
with perfectly normal tissue. So let's say um, an, an healthy colon ordinal. What we can then do is to specifically introduce mutations in this normal tissue to turn a healthy um, organoid into a cancer organoid. And this is something that has been done by a, a colleague of mine, uh, Jana Drost. So what he did um, is he introduced just four mutations in a healthy um, colon organoid. Uh, so these are the, the typical mutations from the fulgurgram, APC, P53, activating KRAS mutation, and SMAD4. And what he saw is that with every mutation that he introduces, and he used CRISPR-Cas9 to do that, is he saw an increase in genetic instability. And very interesting, when he transplanted these organoids, he actually could show that it takes all four of these mutations to, to, to create an invasive carcinoma. Whereas with just three, as you would see here, we have this proliferating cysts, but they do not show the normal um, phenotype of an aggressive carcinoma. The other alternative is we don't have to generate cancer de novo, we can actually just grow cancer that we can isolate from patients. Because like adult tissue stem cells, also cancer cells can be grown in uh, the 3D tissue culture system as organoids. Now, we can use this now to, to model different aspects um, of cancer. We have heard uh, before today heterogeneity, and indeed, organoids are very apt at modeling heterogeneity. On the one hand, um, it can model heterogeneity on the level of the patient, so the difference from one patient to another, but on the other hand, and this is what <coughs> I will show you later, is it can also be used to actually model the heterogeneity within a single tumor. So to look at patient um, diversity, we have created a wide range of different um, organoid cancer biobanks in the last four years, so um, I think seven <coughs> um, colorectal carcinoma, breast cancer, bladder cancer, pancreatic cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, ovarian cancer, and I think the most recent one now is head and neck cancer. And generally, what we're doing there is um, we take the surgical resection, we isolate both organoids from the tumor and organoids from the normal tissue. We do a DNA sequence analy analysis, um, RNA um, analysis, in some cases, we also did some epigenetic study on those. And very importantly, we also do functional assays. So we actually perform a drug screening on these organoids to show that we actually see significant differences between patients. So for example, here you have one, um, one uh, patient that was very uh, susceptible to NAPLIN3, um, of course, because this tumor still had an uh, functional P53. Um, now, as I mentioned, these, these biobanks are very useful to look at heterogeneity between patients. But we were wondering, can we also show that heterogeneity within a tumor can be modeled in the organoid? Now, you might say we don't really need organoids to, to look at tumor heterogeneity. Um, the single cell techniques are continuously improving. We can do single cell DNA sequencing. We can do single cell RNA sequencing. So do we really need that? My answer would be yes, and mostly for one reason. You can do all these things, but what you cannot do is you cannot look at functional heterogeneity. And I will show you what I mean with that. So what we can do, and this is work that has been mostly done by Nobu Sasaki in our lab, is, so what he did is he, he took a tumor, he took biopsies from these different regions of this tumor, he took all of that as organoids in culture, he made subclones from these individual biopsies again, and then studied the clonal lines that he derived from these on a genetic, on an epigenetic, on, on a functional level. And looking just at the genetic heterogeneity, so these are three different patients, um, so the distance here would correlate to the amount of mutations that distinguish the individual clones you can see here. So these are um, individual clones. The colors are the different biopsy regions. Um, and you can see that this one has many, many more mutations than the other ones. And this is because this was a microsatellite instable tumor. 
And then um, he actually, together uh, with Mike Stratton, uh, performed also drug screenings on all these individual clones. And you can see that there's quite a diversity here in the drug response of these subpopulations of the one original tumor. Now, in some cases, this can be explained by the genetics, like here, for example, um, we have here a branch that is highly resistant um, to NAPLIN3, and that can, of course, be explained with an, a P53 mutation that was acquired here, whereas these are highly susceptible. But others can actually not really be explained genetically. So, for example, if we look at these three clones here, um, when we treat them now with SN38, which is the active compound uh, from Irinitikan, um, you can see that two of these are actually highly susceptible to this compound, whereas the third one is completely resistant. So the point that I want to make is that um, genetic heterogeneity, gene expression, is not really sufficient to, to depict the actual functional heterogeneity that we encounter when we actually want to target cancer with drugs. This is why um, I think the organoid technology has huge potential to um, look at this functional heterogeneity and in the end make a difference for patients in the sense of uh, personalized medicine and really um, targeting therapy to the individual patient. Right, that brings me to um, the last application I want to talk about today. And this is probably the most advanced one. I, we heard some mentions today already. Um, and that is using organoids to personalize um, cystic fibrosis treatment. Um, yeah, I think most of you are aware cystic fibrosis is most common genetic disease in the European population caused by mutations in CFTR. There are many, many different mutations. Some of them um, cause premature degradation of the ion channel. Some of them uh, just cause misfolding that it cannot integrate. Some of them prevent the channel from opening. In any case, it leads to an imbalance in the uh, sodium and chloride um, balance in the mostly the lung, which causes a thickening of the mucus and um, infection. Now there are different drugs that can for example, help to refold the protein and to insert it back into the, the membrane. Others that can open channels that are, would otherwise not be able to open properly. And these drugs <coughs> can then help to restore the balance, uh, thin out the mucus, and essentially help the patient to live almost symptom free. So this is work, um, I, I have to say, that was um, done uh, in collaboration with Jeff Beckman, who was probably the first one to, to think about using organoids um, as a method to, to study cystic fibrosis. So the big problem with cystic fibrosis is that there are so many different <coughs> mutations. So there are more than 2,000 different ones, but actually half of all the cases are this f 508 dell mutation. So of course, drugs are primarily targeted <coughs> at these because this is just the biggest patient population. But these many, many, many other patients, often just populations of three or five patients that share the same uh, mutation, will never really have the chance to benefit from these, uh, from these drugs because they cannot, they cannot undergo clinical trials for this very small patient population. This is why um, there is the need for an essay, for a predictive assay that can actually say whether one of the already established drugs can work for some of these extremely um, rare mutations. And um, to do so, um, we are using this beautiful uh, rectal organoid swelling assay. So essentially, these are uh, rectal organoids. On the left side, that would be a healthy control. You expose them to force choline. And in response, these organoids start to swell. If you now look at the same uh, process in a cystic fibrosis patient, you can see that these organoids hardly swell at all. Now, when you treat this patient with a drug combination that can actually specifically um, restore the, uh, the function of CFTR in this patient, you can see that also the swelling in these organoids is restored. 
are the goalies now, and um, there are some ongoing uh, treat clinical trials to, to show that, is to um, find an <coughs> ideal match for every cystic fibrosis patient um, to see that, that uh, every patient can receive the drug combination that is most beneficial for this patient. Well, uh, with that, um, I have to thank <coughs> many, many people that were involved in um, the work that I've shown you, many uh, former and still <coughs> current members of the Claver's Lab, um, the group of Alexander van Audenard in the Hübrecht, uh, who is working very closely uh, with us, especially on, on all kinds of single cell approaches that we are more and more implementing, the RICE Lab, uh, with whom we worked very closely especially in our liver work, in our liver transplantation work. The Rios lab, uh, who we are doing a lot of imaging with, the Kuppen lab, um, with whom we are a lot of doing a lot of s uh, sequencing. Um, Jeffrey Bigman, who is doing this beautiful cystic, cystic fibrosis work uh, with us. Mike Stratton, um, who was for sure critical for the uh, tumor heterogeneity study that I showed you, and my many, many other um, collaborators in the Netherlands and outside the Netherlands. Of course, I have to thank Hans for giving me the opportunity to do a very, very interesting postdoc in his lab. And last but not least, I want to thank you for your attention and I will be happy to take any questions you may have. Thanks, Helmut, for uh, an amazing talk. Beste bezoeker, het is nu kort over vijf en we gaan ook nog vijftien minuten sluiten. I still want to ask a question to the audience. Sure. Dear visitor, Nemo will close in 15 minutes. How stressful. It's stressful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so do we have some questions for Helmut? Not at all. So normally an, an adult tissue stem cell will only give you cells of that tissue of origin. So an, an, an liver stem cell, if you want, will only produce liver cell and intestinal stem cell will only produce intestinal cells. There are some exceptions to that with, with very artificial culture conditions where we can try to push a stem cell back in its development if you want to maybe um, get a pancreatic cell to make some liver cells. But that only works because also developmentally they are actually quite related. But unless you use force essentially, these adult tissue stem cells will only give you um, cells of the tissue they are actually derived from. Ah, so, okay, LGR5 is, is, is not a magic marker. What, what LGR5 is in most tissues is actually a wind reporter. So rather than saying that LGR5 is a critical component for all stem cells, I would say that wind signaling is a critical component for almost all stem cells. Again, it's hard to completely generalize. Um, but if you just compare them on, on the transcriptome, for example, they are completely different. Yeah, you, you can try to, to make intestine from liver, it's not gonna work. I think, unfortunately, the, the 
the, the correct answer to that is to see the full heterogeneity of the tumor, you need to look at every cell of the tumor. Because when you, when you go down deep enough, every cell will be different and every cell will have um, different mutations. Now, many of these mutations are, of course, not um, affecting the phenotype or the resistance that the cell would have to treatment. Um, I think this is a question that is probably only, can only be answered on the level of an individual patient. Because I showed you one of these patients, uh, microsatellite instable, huge differences between individual clones. The other patient, a lot less. So I would say depending how the mutational load of an individual patient is, you would need um, a higher percentage that, that, that is covered by organoids. But it is clear, we are always working with biopsies here. So we, we, you cannot take the complete tumor out and make 1,200 organoid lines, lines out of them. You can actually, but to be honest, I think it would not be um, very useful. I think there are probably some studies needed to figure out what is the what is the normal amount of biopsies that we have to take to get a comprehensive picture of the heterogeneity in a tumor. But my prediction is that it will vary greatly from patient to patient. whole inflammatory environment, yeah, of course. And how do you reconcile something like that with the fact that you're trying to study heterogeneity, but you're looking at it only from a strand of chromatinity of one commercial cell instead of looking at it in the context mm. of the mm. whole? Mm. I think there are two answers to that. On the one hand, and that has to be clear, an organoid system, the classic organoid system, is a reductionist system. And some may say, okay, that is a weakness, but on the other hand, it is a strength because it is a control system. So we can specifically look at the tumor. That being said, of course, we and probably the whole field is more and more moving into co-culture systems with patient-derived fibroblasts, with components of the immune system, with vas vasculature to exactly look into these aspects. But still, I think you have to keep in mind that the strength of this in vitro system is that you have everything under control. If you just throw all components um, on, on, on this organoid, I think it will be hard to, to really figure out the, what the cause is for the effects that you see afterwards. But yes, it is a challenge. This is where the field is developing now, for sure, um, especially with immune cells. But you have to be always aware that what we're what we're looking at is a reductionist system. Okay. One last question. So um, for almost all our organoid systems, um, so well, let, let me start like this. For almost all our, or in almost all our organoid systems, we have active Winsignamy. We do not always eat at components of Winsignamy because in many cases, these organoids produce the Wins, for example, themselves. The liver um, 
is one of these cases. So uh, for example, in the, in the columbia side systems, we do not have to add wind, but what we do have to add is our spondin, and our, and our spondin is essentially just a wind sensitizer because um, these, these organoids produce wind themselves. And you're of course completely right. Uh, in the liver, we have a wind gradient that uh, controls sonation. Uh, it, it changes the, 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 the enzymes that are expressed in hepatocytes, in sex hepatocytes are very different depending where they are along this wind gradient. And it also affects um, regeneration. Uh, so we know, for example, that from our hepatocyte organoids, uh, those hepatocytes that are close to this wind source are more likely to give us organoids than those that are further away. Um, in our systems uh, itself, we can of course control uh, what kind of hepatocyte profile you get by controlling the amount of wind signaling that you have in the system. Is this 